Welcome back. My name is Chris Kandai. I'm the founding director of Home for Good. And each day we've been looking at a different part of the book of Philippians. And today we come to the final chapter, chapter four. And we're talking about the secret power of integrity. Now, I don't know about you, but being in lockdown has done strange things to my work-life balance. There's no distinction distinction between my work time and my home time or my family time and my work time. They're all kind of bleeding into one another uh, because I'm working from the garage or I'm working in the garden and uh, we have a busy house. We've got six kids, one wife, one small fridge and uh, you know life is kind of on top of each other. And the same is true of many of the people that we connect with. I, I, I'm in a lot of Zoom calls or Skype calls and everyone's kind of wrestling between kind of boomeranging between family and work and work and family. Sometimes kids come into the Zoom call and actually that's lovely. We're getting to see each other's houses and families. We're connecting it a different way, which is strange because we're all socially separate. But normally there is a massive distinction between who we are at home and who we are outside. Uh, many of us commute to work. We leave our home and maybe we're a wife or a husband or a son or a sister or a brother or a father and we get into the car or we get on the tube we get on our bicycle and we've got to transform into being i don't know a teacher a doctor a business leader a scientist and and that commute is a transformation a little bit like when clark kent goes into a telephone box and he's bespectacled and nerdy and in a few seconds he comes out again and he's Superman, and he's had this kind of transformation. Well, our commute is often that, isn't it? This, this transformation of one person to another, the person the world needs to see and the person that I am at home. But lockdown conflates that. It changes us so that, that now we're, we're just one person, aren't we? Uh, we're the same person that's at work and at home, and that can be challenging. How do you switch off? How do you uh, give enough attention to your children or your loved ones or your neighbours when you're supposed to be working? How do, how do you do that? And there's a lot I think we can learn from Paul because Paul is an evangelist. He's an apostle. He's a church planter. He's a theologian, but he's also a prisoner. And in the letter to the Philippians, this letter so full of joy, Paul is trying to give us clues about how to live integrated lives for God because we, we are in the end only one person. We might have different modes that we're in but we're just one person. How can we be more fully who we are? How can we bring our whole selves to work and our whole selves home? What does it mean to live a joined up life so we're not schizophrenic presenting one person to the world and being someone else to God and being someone else to our family? I think Paul gives us some clues and he does that in chapter four, the last chapter of Philippians. And it starts in an interesting way. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 2. I plead with Euodia and Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Paul's asking for there to be integration or reconciliation between people that have fallen out in the church in Philippi. And there are two women, Euodia and Syntyche, who he has the most respect for, you can imagine. He calls them um, fellow workers. They've contended at Paul's side for the gospel. Love Paul's way of describing them, that these women are leaders in the church. Paul doesn't say, well, I'm an apostle and they've served below me or behind me. No, they served alongside with me. They, he gives them equal dignity and prestige within the life of the church. Some people have a, an issue about women leaders. I don't know how they deal with this because Paul is very clear that these are co-workers contending alongside him for the gospel. And Paul's saying, I want there to be integration, reconciliation between people in the church. So this idea of integrity is not just about being internally connected. It's about how we're externally connected to live out the gospel. You've pled for the gospel, you owe your intensity. Now live it out in the way that you relate to one another. And then in verse four, Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul's letter to the Philippians is so full of joy. In chapter one, Paul's 
talking about the joy that he has in seeing that the Philippian church is growing and they're contending for the gospel. In chapter two, he talks about the joy that he has in seeing the church working as one body together. In chapter three, he says, finally, I tell you, rejoice. And uh, it's, it's a delight for him to pass on this joy that they have. And for me, that's really important when it comes to integrity. You see, wherever we are and whoever we're supposed to be, God is gonna be the same wherever we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. Whether we're at home or at work or in lockdown, God is the same. And therefore our source of joy never changes. This is so important for us because when we find our joy or our sense of uh, utmost pleasure in our position, maybe our influence in work, then, then our joy is gonna go up and down. You know, if we think we're an Instagram influencer and we've got less followers than someone else, then our joy goes up and down. If we think we're a, a powerful, important person because of our bank balance, our joy is gonna go up and down. And um, Paul says, no, rejoice in the Lord. Your source of joy is the same, whether you're at home, at work, or in lockdown. And therefore you can be steady because God never changes and our source for joy never changes. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. That's interesting too, isn't it? Some people think gentleness, well that's for the home, but power and strength, that's for outside. But Paul says, no, uh, actually, let your gentleness be evident to all in every connection that you have with anybody, let it be conditioned by gentleness. That's not often an aspiration that people have. I want to be powerful, I want to be strong, I want to be resilient, I want to be influential. Very few people say, I want to be gentle. Paul says, I want you to be gentle with everybody. Why? Because the Lord is near. Because God cares for every person you and I are going to have connection with, whether that's at home or at work or in travel, we're going to need that same sense of gentleness. And the fact that God is near is important. Do you remember when you used to play in the playground at school and uh, there was a bit of rough and tumble going on with you and some of the other lads, but if you knew their parents were watching, maybe you were a little bit gentler in the way that you played in case their huge dad or their scary mum uh, would come over and sort you out. Well, maybe that's the same idea. Show gentleness in your relationships with everybody because God is watching and he's concerned about all those people that we're interacting with. Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Paul says, look, you don't need to be anxious about anything and you can pray about everything. That's another reason for integrity, isn't it? Sometimes you might be anxious because of how things are going at work. Or you might be anxious about how things are going in the family. Paul says you can bring all of that to God. You don't need to hold on to your anxiety. You can offer that anxiety up to God. You don't need to put on a brave face or fake it till you make it out there in the world because you're bringing your anxiety to God. I was speaking to um, uh, a business leader called Patrick Lencioni uh, the other week and uh, he talked about the fact that he often gets nervous when he speaks, he speaks in front of huge audiences. And so what he does is he tells people how he's thinking, it's like breaking the fourth wall in a drama. He says, guys, I want you to know I'm feeling a little bit anxious and worried. And by letting that anxiety out, we're now with him, we're, we're, we're on his side, he's not trying to prove anything. And, and I, I wonder whether that form of integrity, that honesty about what's really going on with us, once we have that with God and we're able to talk about it with God, maybe there's room for us to have that with other people. We don't have to have this facade about pretending to be someone that we're not because our anxieties are being cast on God. And what about this amazing picture? Then the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, I know I need that. I know in these days of lockdown, sometimes my mind wanders into dark places and my desires are for dark things. I, 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 I start to get worried, I start to get anxious, I start to get um, perturbed about what's going on or what the future's gonna be like, what's it gonna be like for my kids, uh, what about the economy, what about my, my kids getting jobs when they need to as they finish at uni soon. I'm worried and I'm anxious and my heart beats and my mind is, is concerned. 
But as we cast our anxieties to God, the peace of God will come and will act as a guard. It's like a refuge for our hearts and minds. I wonder if it's a little bit like those guard rails you have on a bowling alley. You know, the ones to stop the ball going into the gutter. God's peace will be like a guardrail for our thoughts and our desires, our hearts and our minds, and stop them going into the gutter because that's God's protection around us. But we're also told how else we can do that with our minds. Verse eight, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's a lovely idea, isn't it? For me, sometimes the news is the last thing I watch at night and the first thing I check in the morning. And it's all pretty dark. I was scanning the headlines uh, this morning in The Guardian and it was all about the coronavirus, all about its negative effects on uh, health and on the economy and on industry and on entertainment and and the global food shortage. And, And it's pretty easy for us to be overwhelmed by just how bad things are. And it's important that we're informed, but it's important we're not overwhelmed. And I think Paul's saying, well, you know, here I am in prison, but I, I found a way to keep a sense of joy and peace and stability in my life by making sure my mind's meditating, reflecting on, spending time in the, in the presence of the truly good and pure and noble and lovely. And one of the ways we do that is by building time in our lives for the Bible. It's great that Spring Harvest have been providing this kind of daily thought for the day. And uh, these are lovely things for us to be thinking about, the riches and beauty and wonder of Scripture. And and after you've done that, maybe there's some time that you want to spend alone just reading the Bible. And if Bible reading is hard for you right now, go to the parts of the Bible that always used to wake up your soul. For me, it it was the book of Philippians. That's why I'm sharing it with you because it's been such a help to me even now in lockdown. Um, Or or it could be Bible memorization that you spend time trying to get a verse into your brain so it becomes part of your second nature. Uh, It's quite a lovely thing to fall asleep to. Just uh, write a little verse out uh, on a card and uh, just read a bit and try and say it in your mind. And if you can't get it right, read a bit again. And that process, man, if you don't go to sleep, you're getting the Bible into you. And if you do fall asleep because that's hard, well, that's a win because you've fallen asleep. So maybe um, this kind of reflecting on what is pure and good and lovely could involve uh, scripture. Um, Other people find a lot of help reading great Christian books. And uh, I recommend to you biographies right now, particularly biographies of people that have been through some really tough times. Uh, Think about Elizabeth Elliot, her book, Through Gates of Splendor. Uh, or maybe Jim Elliot, her husband, who was uh, a martyr, a Christian missionary martyr. Uh, his book was called, um, not Through Goats, it's been there. Uh, oh, I can't remember what his book was called. You might want to try some biographies uh, you, because seeing how other people have wrestled with difficult things in the past uh, can help us find resilience and power to keep trusting God too. Uh, so. That could be another useful thing you could do. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. There's a challenge. Paul is saying, don't just do what I say, see what I do. He, he says, I have tried to live this out. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. That's a challenge to integrity. Paul says he's been trying to live out the Christian life. He's tried to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And and he's agreeing that he could be a role model. Now, Paul's an incredibly humble man. He calls himself the worst of all sinners. So it's an interesting balance, isn't it? That he's got this sense of humility about himself, that it's only because of Jesus that he's um, able to be saved, able to lead. But he also recognises that one of the roles of a leader is to set a model of how we should live and he's calling people to emulate that. I think for all of us who have leadership roles at home uh, or in the office or in church or in society, that's got to be the challenge for our integrity. Is our walk and our talk integrated? Do our lips sync with our lives? Is there a connect between the faith that we profess and the faith that we live? That's the challenge I think that this book of Philippians gives us. 
So friends, I hope that's been helpful. I've loved spending a bit of time with you. If I can be of any help to you, please reach out to me on social media. I'd love to be in touch. I do a little series called Faith and Quarantine. So if you watch maybe the Spring Harvest stuff in the morning, because it's brilliant, and uh, come and join me at eight o'clock on my YouTube channel. But it's been lovely to spend time with you. Hopefully see you again soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.